this evening. I'd like to start again in the book of Romans, and I'm going to read a verse of scripture there and kind of springboard again from that. Romans chapter number 12, verse number 6. Start with, would you stand with me? Romans chapter 12 and, and verse number 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait in our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching. He that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Would you go now, please, to the book of Acts? The book of Acts. And I would like to go to the second chapter. I'd like to go to the 16th verse. And uh, we're going to continue tonight to be probably a bit more teacher than preacher. I'm not really sure there's that much difference when I do it. But, but Acts chapter number 2 and verse 16. This is an event taking place on the day of Pentecost, the birth date, some would say the church. 3,000 people got saved that day. Not bad. And um, as a part of that which had taken place, the Spirit had been outpoured. 120 had been baptized with the Spirit, which led directly to 3,000 people getting saved. But as the crowd was gathering together and, and watching that which was taking place and, and trying to get a handle on what was going on, and some were saying, oh, they're all just drunk, which that almost begs to be preached. There's a lot of churches that they would not accuse us of being drunk. They may call for the services of the undertaker, you know, bring in the uh, medics to see if we're breathing. You know, is, there, is there yet any life? But uh, that bunch, they began, by, they began church by having to explain we're not drunk, at least not in the way that you think. And then Peter goes on to say in verse 16, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That was his text for the message he was going to preach. But he said, this is that which the prophet Joel said would take place. And it's interesting in those opening verses that he talks more than once the fact that when the Spirit would fall in the latter days, he said that your sons and your daughters would prophesy. Young men see visions, supernatural things that would take the place, to take place in the life of normal people. Would you pray this with me? Heavenly Father, open my heart that I may hear what you would say to me, change my life, make me more like Jesus, in his precious name, amen. You may be seated. If we understand the scripture correctly, and when I say we there, I'm, I'm, I'm meaning more than just if I understand it correctly. But if the perception that has been a part of full gospel theology 
Pentecostal understanding over the years is accurate. It is that in the last day outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and we do believe that we are living probably in the last of the last days, that in that outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that it would be a supernatural outpouring. Signs and wonders would take place. And that's long been a part of who we are as Pentecostal believers, that we are people that believe in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and believe in signs and wonders that would take place. And, and a sign and a wonder is usually something. One, one person said it's a sign that causes you to wonder. Sometimes it's that which God has done to attract attention to who He is. And sometimes it's things that take place that have caused no little bit of discomfort in the body of Christ. It's amazing how sometimes that even in places where we should be comfortable with the operation of the Holy Spirit, we are not comfortable. I would never name the source of the place, but I knew a preacher, a friend of mine, who made the statement on one occasion that, uh, that he was Pentecostal and, and, and he was going on to talk about uh, certain things being Pentecostal and certain things not being Pentecostal. And as he was going through his definitions, I became aware of the fact that while he was viewing himself as traditional Pentecostal, I would have taken exception to his understanding of that term traditional Pentecostal. I would have said to him, my brother, I love you, I respect you, but you are at best second generation in your understanding. Because some of the things that he was denying the existence of were the very things that when you go to our books of history were the inception of who we are, who we were and where we come from. Well, Peter says under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, as he quotes Joel the prophet, that when God begins to move in the last days, that one of the things that, that will increase is the flow of the prophetic. Now that creates some problems for us. You see, Pentecostal worship can be messy. Not that we intend it to be that way. I do believe that Scripture tells us that there is a, a, a form and that there's a, uh, although all things can be done decently and in order although I'm not sure that we all have the same interpretation of what is decent and in order. I'm not sure sometimes of what we have interpreted is the same thing that God interprets as decent and in order. That there is a structure and order that God will have in given meetings, and it may be sometimes that our structure may not be exactly His. But it, it does seem to be true that in much of Pentecostal worship, that there is a certain messiness that can take place because you never are totally sure what might happen. Side note, I have said over the years that Pentecostals are courageous because when you do a Pentecostal testimony service where you give people an opportunity to share stories of what Jesus is doing in the life, you're never sure what might take place. I've been around very long, you understand what I'm talking about. I've been in some meetings where somebody stood to testify and they put the place in orbit. When they began to share what Jesus was doing, it just, it lifted everything. And I've been in other services where somebody was testifying and they killed the meeting. I've been in a few that I wanted just to put a plug in their mouth. <laughs> just, in fact, I, I, I have, well, I won't go there. Wisdom just set in and I'm not going to go there. Sometimes we become somewhat afraid of Pentecostal services because we're not really sure that we know what's going to take place. Adventure is there. And sometimes you're out there saying, Holy Spirit, what is it that you want to do? And it's moment by moment that it gives you guidance and direction. And I'm not campaigning for that which is weird. I'm not campaigning for just being peculiar. But in Acts, Peter talks about this thing of prophecy. I mentioned last night in passing, I have a love-hate relationship with prophecy. For I have seen 
through the prophetic word, incredible things take place. I have had the privilege from God of being on the end of sharing a word that God used to, to powerfully minister to some individual, a, 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 whether it's a prophetic word or maybe another operation of the Spirit uh, that a, absolutely transformed their life. And I've also been on the receiving end of that which was not from God. And I've watched people go through hurts and confusion and over the whole issue. The solution is not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, which is how many deal with it. There are some individuals, indeed there is, a, there is a movement right now within a number of Assemblies of God churches, good pastors, good people, good churches that are afraid of an operation of the Spirit. And so they have made uh, announcements that there will be no tongues, no interpretation, no prophetic utterances in their church on a Sunday morning. I said, indeed, not long ago with the district leadership of one of our districts here in, in, in the United States, and, and we were conversing about this very matter. He was sharing with us uh, that some of their churches in their district had, had made those sort of statements, and now some of those pastors were trying to, to deal with the fact that on the one hand, uh, they, they wanted to see their people filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, they wanted their people to be Pentecostal, but on the other hand, uh, they were afraid of some of the things that might take place and they're trying to work their way through this. And in one sense, it created something for themselves that's going to be very, very difficult to reconcile. And so there is a certain movement by individuals who, and I don't question their love for Jesus, and I'm, I'm certain that they mean well, but in some cases, uh, fear of what might take place has caused them to say, we're just not going to permit this particular manifestation or demonstration of the Spirit. And yet, Scripture makes it clear in the last days, God said, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. That in the flow of the coming revival that we can expect an increased prophetic to take place. But as we see it increased prophetic take place, we need to understand there'll be both the true and the false. That there'll be both the increase of that which is genuine and there'll be an increase of that which is not genuine. In some cases, it will be actually demonically inspired. In some cases, in many cases probably, it will be people speaking out of their heart rather than God's heart. People who are stirred up at what's taking place. In some cases, want to be a part of something dynamic that's happening. And so they give vent to expression, but it really wasn't from God. It was out of their own spirit. But the misuse of the gifts of the Spirit are not reason for us to shut down the operation. Rather, it's for us to begin to say, God, how do we seek to excel? You see, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians Chapter 14, if you'd like to go there real quickly. And he's and speaking in the 12th verse, he says this, Even so ye, for as much as you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. He applauds them. You are zealous for spiritual gifts. He commends them for that. And I would commend the church that is zealous for the operation of the Spirit. Uh, I will commend the church uh, that is zealous for the gifts of the Spirit to be in operation. But then he says this, uh, Seek that you may excel to the edifying, building up of the church. The purpose of the gifts that the church will be built up, be edified. But it's an interesting expression, seek to excel. You see, what we need to understand with every gift of the Spirit uh, is that you have the cooperation between human on the one hand and divine on the other. You see, there are those who dismiss the gifts of the Spirit totally and simply say it's nothing but human flesh uh, and it's human excitement, and they dismiss the operation of the gifts of the Spirit. They're wrong to do that. On the other hand, there are those who fail to understand that it's not just God. So you have those who see the God side, and, 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 and sometimes they will not improve on their operation. 
every gift of the Spirit has the God side and it has the human side. You see, the Scripture says, seek to excel. That means do it better. Now, let me ask you a question that in the answering of the question, the answer comes through. How do you improve on deity? How do you get better than divine? I would understand that you cannot do better than divine. You cannot do better than deity. And yet the apostle says, I want you to excel, seek to excel, seek to improve the operation of the gifts of the Spirit. Therefore, what he must be saying to us is you have in, the, in any gift of the Spirit, you have the God side, but you also have the human side. I cannot improve on God's side. I can seek to improve on the human side. Let me give you an illustration. Out of my early days of ministry, just after Noah got off of the boat. I was in my first church. I was 21 years of age, and I was the senior pastor. That's a frightening thought. We had a dear brother in the church that from time to time, the Spirit of the Lord would come upon him, would stir him, and he would give a prophetic utterance or a tongue or an interpretation, usually the interpretation or the prophecy. He began every expression the same way, and I'm going to illustrate what he would do. He would be sitting in his seat, just kind of sitting there, and service would be moving along, and he would sense the Spirit come upon him, and he would begin every utterance this way. He would explode out of his seat just like I did, land in the middle aisle with the train whistle, and then he would begin his utterance. Now, the utterances really were very good. And often the things that he had to share with us by the Spirit did edify and did exhort and did comfort. However, most of us missed the first third. Because we're still trying to get our hearts out of our throats and get them back down where they belonged. And so we would miss what he would say because we were so caught off guard with the expression. Now, I didn't know what to do with it then. Now, if I were his pastor today, I think I I could say something like this. Brother, let me help you. The word that you are giving is awesome. The word that you're giving is a good word. It's a God word. The anointing is there. We need that word, but we don't need the train whistle. Seek to excel. The word you have is good, but there's a way that you can give that word and be doing it better than you currently are. You see, some mistake, something that happens in the flesh as being essential for the demonstration of the Spirit. The first time I ever gave an interpretation in tongues, my knees were having close fellowship. In fact, I remember the events leading up to it. The Lord really set me up. We were in revival. I was the pastor. I had never given utterance in tongues or interpretation. I'm just sitting on the platform, and suddenly the evangelist spins around, points at me and says, Give that word that God's given you. I didn't have anything. So I'll just be very honest with you. I pulled the Pentecostal cop out. I just prayed in tongues a while. I think I was probably in deep intercession. I was probably pleading for God to intervene in the situation. I just, I prayed in tongues a while. And then he began to give what the people thought was an interpretation. What I know was a prophetic word because uh, I was not giving an utterance of tongues for interpretation. I was just desperate. But the next night, God gave me a word. And from the events that happened the night before, I took a step of faith. My knees were knocking, but I went ahead and shared that word. Now, as time has passed, my knees rarely have close fellowship when I'm giving an utterance. You see, the close fellowship of the knees was my fleshly reaction to the move of the Spirit. That wasn't the God's side. Seek to excel. As God pours out His Spirit, and some of you, God wants to use you in the prophetic. To bring a prophetic word in the house of the Lord. To bring a word that will bring edification or exhortation or comfort to God's people. 
And maybe be that God wants to use some of you in, in, in other gifts of the Holy Spirit. But you need to understand you can learn to improve. Now, we used to do an exercise when I was pastoring that when there would be a prophetic word or an interpretation, after you know, been some time of worship and thanksgiving and a, an appropriate you know time for people to respond in the spirit, uh, I would often just stop the service and say something like this. Now, what did the Lord just say to us? And I would ask people to recap. I would ask them to share a phrase that had spoken to their hearts. I said, something that took place uh, as that prophetic word was given that spoke to you, just share that phrase with us. And we'd take the next few moments, and, and various individuals would just share out, just speak out a phrase uh, that administered to them. And in a few moments, we would reconstruct the entirety of the word. Now, for most of the church, uh, that was a powerful thing as they were reemphasizing that which the Spirit had said. But it had a few people that that offended. Because they thought the whole operation was so holy that for us uh, to begin to rephrase and say, what was it the Spirit said, uh, that they thought we were, that we were doing something that was, must be totally, totally wrong. They failed to understand there's cooperation of human and divine. Beside that, I used to say to them, if God really spoke to us, it's important that we know what He said. I've had people say this to me, man, whoa, did we have church last night? There were three tongues and interpretations and three prophecies. Did we have church? And I would say, what did God say? I don't remember. I wasn't listening. Just, you know, three tongues, interpretations, prophecies. I was having doodads. You know, I was feeling good. Well, I'm glad you felt good, but if God spoke to us, he probably wanted us to listen to what he was saying. And so it's okay for you when God speaks, you know, take a note on it. Observe what he said. You know, be aware of it. As we're in this last days, as revival increases, as the Spirit's flow continues to increase, some of you will be moving more in the area of not only receiving but giving prophetic words. Not only in settings like this, but God may give you a word for an individual. Therefore, it's important that we learn how to judge those words. It's important that we learn to recognize there's both that which is genuine and that which is not genuine. It's important that we learn how to respond and how to be used by the Lord in the operation of the Spirit. Now, last night, we focused mostly on the receiving end. And I, I'm going to take just a moment to deal with, with four more things on the receiving end. And then I'll talk about how to let God use you in this area. Every prophetic word has four things you need to understand. There's, first of all, revelation. What does it say? What is it that God actually said in that prophetic word? The second thing every prophecy has is interpretation. What does it mean? Not only what did he say, but what does it mean? You may have heard, by the way, about the, about the individual, the, the farmer who was sitting in the field, and he suddenly saw a finger appear in the sky, and, and he saw that finger write two letters, GP. Revelation, he saw what it said. He jumped and said, hallelujah, God's called me to preach. That stands for go preach. Somebody said it stood just as easy for go plow. So you have not only revelation, you have interpretation. What is it that was meant by that word that the Lord brought? And so when you're on the end of receiving, it's not only what did he say, but what does it mean? Now, in the process of discovering what does it mean, you're going to be saying, well, what does that mean scripturally? What does it mean just in the normal use of that word? Sometimes it means you may sit down with somebody and say, who, who, who is spiritually mature and share with them and say, what do you sense this means? Interpretation. Number three is application. How do I apply it? How do I personally apply this word to my life? It's not only what did God say and what does God mean, but what do I do with it? How do I apply this word in my life? Number four, timing. When does it happen? I've long believed that you do not have to do anything in your part to make a word from the Lord happen. 
you do have to be obedient to him. And there will be moments of timings. There will be things that the Lord will speak to your heart. There will be moments that you'll be on the receiving end of something from God, and the timing of, of that may not be for several years. You see, God views time a little different than we do. We tend to, and, and, and have you noticed as you go down the road of life that there's a little difference in how you view time as well? To the younger ones in this meeting, 20 minutes can be an eternity. You know, you get in your car, you've been in the car seven minutes. Are we there yet? No, sweetheart, we're going to drive for about an hour. Okay, four minutes later. Are we there yet? Because they have absolutely no concept. What's an hour? You know, for them, that is an eternity. But for some of us who've been around a while, an hour is minuscule compared to how the amount of time that we've been around. We view things. What's that? Lord, give me an hour. <laughs> timing is also very important in the prophetic. Moving in God's timing. Understanding God may give you a word, but the fulfillment not be for some season. I mentioned last night, God called me to preach when I was 11 going on 12, but nobody wanted to hear me. I did not start out preaching right away. There were some other things that had to take place. And I often say to young people who, who will tell me God's called me to preach in the service, and I will rejoice with them at what God has done. But then I begin to tell them there's some things you can begin to do. And one of them is simply develop consistency in your personal walk with Jesus. And that means become consistent in your daily devotional time. Learning how to spend time every day with the Lord in prayer. Learning how to spend time every day with God in His Word. Learning how to listen to Him. I said that you're beginning, I said you become consistent in that part. You become consistent and faithful in the house of the Lord. And the early assignments God's given you. The first preaching assignment I had was not to preach to thousands of people. I spoke to children's church. You know, that was, that's where I started. You know, that, that you, you don't start that. You start at a particular level, and you begin to grow from there. So God may tell you kind of in advance. It, it's a bit like looking at some of the, some of the ranges that you will see here in, in hill country or, or if you get in some of the other mountain ranges where you can see a series of ranges. But you can't see the distance between them. And sometimes the Lord shows you prophetically the ranges. He tells you the highlights of what's out there, but he doesn't always tell you how much time there is from, from the first range to the second range, what the space is. You just get the highlights. And so there's this matter of allowing the Holy Spirit to bring the past, the timing that's going to be required in the fulfillment of the prophetic word. So if you're on the receiving end, understand you're going to know what did God say, what does it mean, how do I apply it, when. Am I supposed to act upon this thing? But some of you, God is not only going to allow you to be on the receiving end, God is going to begin to use you at some point in the gifts of the Spirit. And it's a challenging thing because, you see, once again, that's an adventure. And the safe thing is for us to say, the only operation in the Spirit that should ever take place should come from the pulpit. But we're missing what God intends. Because in, in Acts chapter 2, when Peter is speaking, he doesn't just say that the apostles will prophesy. He says, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Now, I love watching what God does in the lives of young people. And I have, I have heard God, seen God do the most incredible thing. Let me tell you a couple of stories. I was in a meeting. This was a little while back now. It was when revival was first starting to break for us. And uh, we're in a meeting this night, and, and I'm, I'm doing testimonies. You know, I just give the people a chance, share some stories, what's Jesus doing in your life? And, and, and this little girl raises her hand, and I'm guessing she must have been nine years of age, maybe eight, nine, some of that area. She lifts her hand, and so I go to her, and I, yes, sweetheart, what did Jesus do? She said, last night, you know, while I was being prayed for, and she was slain in the Spirit, she said, Jesus took me to heaven. 
And I said to her, that's cool. Wow, that's neat. God bless you. Thank you. And I walked off. Because in my mind, I'm thinking, she's eight years of age, you know. So I really wasn't sure what she would say, so I didn't go any further. But after the meeting, I went back to her and said, Sweetheart, tell me what Jesus showed you when he took you to heaven last night. And she began to describe things to me that I knew, not only that I know were in Scripture, but I also knew from some other study I had done on those who had had after-death experiences who had been clinically dead and, and come back to life again that some of the things they had described seeing in heaven, she was describing the same things to me. At a level that I knew that most 8- to 9-year-olds, you know, they don't really go read that sort of material. And she's describing stuff that I recognized this was not... Uh, what I would have expected. In fact, every single night uh, during that revival, she'd have another encounter where the Lord would take her to heaven again and He would show her the things that were going to come. He would he talked to, took her to her room in heaven, showed her her crown that was in heaven. And then one day while they were in heaven, He takes her to a pond and said to her, you're going to become a fisher of men. I mean, night by night, she is sharing this stuff with me that Jesus, uh, I love watching Jesus touch the lives of our sons and our daughters, little ones. I'm, I mean, I'm, now my mind is spinning which stories to tell, which ones not to tell because of time frame. Because the Spirit of the Lord, we, we, were, we were doing a meeting in Arkansas. And um, little girl, first night. It, it was really one of those really special moments because uh, we walk into the meeting. This lady walks up to us and she says, you probably don't remember me. She was right. But she said, I was in your first church. Oh, right after Noah got off the boat. <laughs> She said, I was, I was in your first church. And she, said, uh, and she said, I remember being at your house. My wife and I do not remember that. But she said, but I was there for a missionette sleepover. And she talked about, you know, being in, being in, in our first church and, and how Jesus had touched her life uh, during those days. And she would given her life to the Lord. And then her parents had moved to Arkansas. And we hadn't seen her in, in, in at that point, I don't know, let's see, 30-some years. And now here she is uh, in this church. And she has a little girl who was the same age she was when she was in our first church. And now this little girl is in the services and... The opening night, the Spirit of the Lord breaks in the meeting, and this little girl's touched powerfully at the altar, and, and she's, she's having an encounter where she's seeing the angels flying around the building, and she's describing to her mother the things that she is seeing in the Spirit. I love watching God do something in the lives of our sons and, and our daughters. But he says, you're young men, servants, handmaidens, that in the last days that there will come operations of the Holy Spirit uh, that will take place in their lives. He will flow through them. Not just in apostles' lives and, and teachers' lives and pastors' lives and evangelists' lives and prophets' lives, uh, but in the lives of sons and daughters and servants and handmaidens. He would pour out His Spirit. And one of the things that would happen when he pours out his spirit, is that they will move in the gifts of the spirit, including prophecy. Now, does that mean every time you open your mouth that you're prophesying? No. There are some individuals that just believe they have to be giving a prophetic word every time they open their mouth. And usually what they end up giving is a pathetic word. That you're not going to always be flowing that way. For some of you, maybe from time to time, God will give you a word. For others of you, God may cause that to be something that you will move in more regularly. I remember as a teenager, 
being in a service, a youth meeting, and, and somebody gave an utterance in tongues in that meeting, and my mother, who was the youth director, was sitting there thinking, Lord, you, you just made a mistake because there's nobody in this meeting that interprets. And while she is saying that to the Lord, the young man who had been elected the president of the youth group, who had never given an interpretation in his life, stepped up and gave the interpretation of the utterance that had been given. Simply made himself available to the Lord. He looked around and said, Lord, there's nobody here that interprets. So, Lord, I'll make myself available to you. Well, let me share with you for a few moments tonight just a few little things to help you as God begins to use you in prophecy or really in any of the gifts of the Spirit. And I have three things I want to leave with you. Very simple. Number one, examine your motives. You see, there is a temptation when God begins to use you to think that you have to be used to impress others with how spiritual you are. Listen, God one time delivered a message through a donkey. Okay? So messenger is not a big deal. You know, so don't get impressed with yourself. You know, it, it may just be God looked around and said, you're a pretty good looking donkey. You know, and I think I can use you. And so the issue is not, you know, who you are. The issue is what is it that God wants to say? It's constantly be searching your own motives. Why? Am I wanting others to see me as a spiritual giant? Young man, young preacher, early in his ministry, and he's at what he thought was a very august gathering. It was the old sectional fellowship meetings where all the preachers would get together in the church that have church and house was full and, and, and somebody gives an utterance in tongues and he really wants to impress the people that he too is a man of God. God uses him and so the utterance finishes. He jumps out and says the, for thus saith the Lord and nothing happened. And then he backs up and says for the Lord would say nothing happened. The third time he said what would the Lord say and sat down thoroughly chastised, thoroughly embarrassed, but learned a valuable lesson. It's not about you. It's not about impressing somebody. You see, that can happen no matter who you are, no matter what stage of life you're in. Personal story, one of those that embarrasses me because I'm in it. We were preaching a meeting at a church, an opening night. I didn't have enough anointing to fill a thimble. If you could pour anointing out into a thimble, I don't think I got enough to fill the thimble. We reach a time in the search, we're praying for people. I'm praying for people, and honestly, if you went by what you saw with the eye, nothing is taking place. On the other side of the building, the pastor is praying for people. Let me tell you what's happening. Every person he prayed for, it was like all heaven descended on them. I mean, people are being, you know, Blown down by the Spirit of God. It's just this awesome looking. My line is getting very short. (laughs) And inside of me, something is beginning to take place. And I find myself saying this, Lord, you could at least anoint me tonight. It's the first night. This is the night they're going to decide, am I coming back? You could at least let me be anointed tonight. Let me at least look like a man of God tonight. All of this jealousy was beginning to arise. And all of the wrong motives for being used by God. In the next day of my time with the Lord, we walked through that. And there was a time of repentance and a time of blessing the Lord for the way he used my brother. And then that night in the meeting, I, I, I got up and simply shared with the people what had taken place the night before. So I'm just going to defang this thing right now. I just told him, I fought jealousy last night because God was using pastor and he wasn't using me. Motives. God's going to continue to use you in the gifts of the Spirit. One of the things you can do is seek to guard your motives. The motivation, 1 Corinthians, was that the church 
could be built up. That the other person would be edified. Not that I would appear to be this great stalwart spiritually. You see, that's a temptation that you're going to find yourself dealing with uh, when God begins to use you. That I want to at least appear to be as spiritual as somebody else around me is. Guard your motives. Number two, give it what I call the 10-second test. I like to claim originality for this, but I heard an evangelist by the name of Ken Krivolovic share this about a million years ago. Okay, slight exaggeration. But I heard him share this, and it just helped me. So I passed it on. I want to give him credit for it. He said, when he would begin to sense that maybe God wanted him to give a prophetic word. And by the way, a little teaching within a teaching. If you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, well, I'll come back and do that next. I, I want to, no, I'm going to go ahead and do that now. In this whole area, being used by God in the gifts of the Spirit, you can ask God. You, you can begin to ask God. You say to Him, Lord, your word says covet earnestly the best gifts. That, that's something God tells you. You can covet the best gifts. Say, so, Lord, I desire to be used in the gifts of the Spirit. I want to be used. But you begin to say, God, I want to be used, but would you teach me how to be used? Here's one of the ways. The 10-second test was this. When this brother would begin to sense that God wanted him to give an utterance, he would say, Lord, I'm going to give this 10 seconds. If this is not you, would you remove it? If it is you, intensify it. And so I, start, I just simply adopted that. When I begin to sense that God wanted me to give a prophetic word in a meeting, Lord, if this is, if this is you, increase it. If it's not you, then I'm going to ask that you would take it away because I don't want to be moving in flesh. Very rarely when I've done that have I had to wait 10 seconds. Usually there's an, almost an immediate response. It either goes away or there's an immediate intensification. But give it the 10-second test. Now a spinoff of that, when God first began to use me, what I began to say to the Lord was this, Lord, I'm not sure my faith level is ready to step out there and be using the gifts. So would you? began by letting me know when an utterance is going to take place. And I got so I could sit in a meeting and almost without exception know when a prophecy or utterance in tongues was going to happen. Now many of you on the very basis of years of maturity recognize that. Many of you know in advance your, your spirit is in tune with the spirit of the Lord to the point that you are not surprised. When an utterance comes, because you're expecting it. Your spirit has already become tuned in enough that you recognize this is the atmosphere in which God tends. You never notice how often tongues, interpretation, prophecy, those three gifts in particular, occur during or at the close of a season of worship? You ever notice that? I don't know I've ever heard a prophetic word in the middle of the announcements. You know, not that God couldn't, but, but basically heaven tends to respond to earth. As we're worshiping him, there tends to be a response from him back to us. And so often it's at the end of a close of worship that the Lord will respond to us. So I mean, say, Lord, let me know when. And so it got to the point I almost always knew there's going to be a word. It's going to be a word. And sure enough, somebody would speak it out. My next step was this, Lord, would you let me know? what the word is but not have me be the one to give it i'm just wanting lord for my hearing to become increased lord let me know now that's subject to god's sovereignty but what often began to happen was when when before someone began to speak i not only knew what a word was going to come i began to know the gist of where the word was going and, and then as they begin to speak the word, it be in line with what I was sensing in my heart. A couple of things happened. Sometimes I could say to somebody else, I can confirm that, which helped them. But it was also building my faith that I'm learning to recognize the voice of the Holy Spirit. You see, we can be practical in this. Now, the scripture makes it clear that God is able to make his voice to be known. The prophets of the Old Testament were able to hear and to see. And I know that God can 
so choose to speak to us in such a way that, that we clearly understand what he was saying without any progression of growth. But for most of us, learning to hear the voice of God is a growing process. Corinthians speaks the fact there are many voices, many sounds. One of the things you have to begin to eliminate is your own, your own thoughts. To have begun to place your will in neutral, where you don't really care what the word is. That you're not campaigning for something one way or the other. That your will is in neutral. And then you begin to hear what it is that God is beginning to say. One of the challenges that I tell people that I candidly will admit to is because I've been in the ministry a long time now. And, 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 and sometimes just out of that experience, you begin to recognize certain signs. I, I, I mentioned it last night. People who are under conviction of the Holy Spirit that often I will recognize the sign. And I'm not sure whether it's a discerning in the Spirit or whether it's experience. But I simply know what they tend to do. And so there is this thing. And, and, and then there's even a thing sometimes when you have been counseling with people. And ministering to people for a period of time, that sometimes you can begin to recognize certain traits and how people act and respond. And so it's, Lord, I don't want to do something and say it was you if it was simply, how do I put this? If it was simply the God given natural discerning process at work. You understand what I'm trying to say? That there's those moments in life that by experience are some things you suspect. I'll give you this illustration. In New Zealand, where we minister a lot, among the indigenous people of the land, statistics suggest that, that as high as three out of four women who are unchurched will be sexually molested by their father when they're growing up. Because in their culture, outside of the church, now it's not officially sanctioned today, but it, it still happens, that, that, it, that, that historically, that the father taught their daughters concerning matters of sexuality by taking their daughters to bed. Now, when I minister in a setting where I'm largely among indigenous people, I already know that. That's an understanding I have. So I know that conservatively, among the unchurched ladies, 50%, likely 75% have been molested. So I have to walk the difference. When is it what I already know? And when is it that voice of the Holy Spirit giving me information that I could not know otherwise? Sometimes you will know things and the Spirit will say, I know that you know that, but I still want to address that subject tonight. And there's somebody here that I want to minister to in that area. And I have to work my way through that. What does it mean, Lord, to be able to discern the difference? But give it the 10-second test. Give yourself time to begin to grow, to begin to mature. Number three, and I'm done, be accountable. Be accountable. Let me, t let me tell you how you can be accountable in three, in three areas. Let the word that you give be judged. Let the word that you give be judged. Now, it may be the sort of setting where you will sense a word in your heart. We have, we have an intercessor that communicates with my wife. And this particular dear lady has written my wife recently in terms of something that she is sensing and feeling in her spirit that she believes is a word from the Lord. And she feels the necessity of communicating that word. Now, one of the ways she can be accountable is to submit that word. Instead of giving it, to submit it to spiritual authorities in her life and allow them to evaluate the word that she is sensing. Somebody says, well, I can't do that. I, it's a word from God. I can't let some person look at it. It may be that the reason that you don't want them to judge is because you're afraid it's not a word from God. Because 1 Corinthians tells us to judge the prophetic word. And if I'm afraid for you to evaluate the word that I believe God's given me, it may be because secretly I'm not convinced I have a word from the Lord. Because if it's genuinely a word from the Lord, then those who are genuinely spiritual and sensitive to the Holy Spirit will recognize there's a word from God. This is a poor illustration of that, but 
we were in revival services and we had uh, Christian press there. And uh, they had come to interview the pastor and myself and then and they had a lot of questions and, and, and they, they uh, felt that some stuff was somewhat controversial. And so, they want, and so we invited them to come to the meeting that night. And then I said uh, to the individual, the reporter, why don't you walk with me while I pray for people? Because this was a reporter who said he was saved and spirit-filled. And so I said, why don't you just walk with me while I pray for people? Just come and stand beside me. That's because if this is God, what I was convinced was this. If this was God and if he was really saved, then the reality would begin to speak to him. I wasn't afraid of it being judged. And I prayed for maybe three people and stopped and spent the next hour while others went to the altar talking to this reporter one-on-one. -on -one. Now he's no longer a reporter. Now he's a hungry seeker asking me questions. Because there are things he did not understand, but he did know the Spirit of God. And he recognized that was God that was doing that. If you're afraid to have your word submitted to somebody for valuation, listen, friend, you are not so spiritual that you are the only pipeline to heaven. Okay? Rarely am I that spiritual that God talks only to me. If you're the only person that God's talking to, I'm a little concerned about the source that you're hearing from. Okay? Be accountable. The second area of accountability is this. You are responsible to obey. You are not responsible to make them obey. Now, that, that breaks down two ways. You see, there are some individuals who God will give them a word or an impression. They will share that word. It may be that they will sense God's given the word for the pastor. And they will share that. But then they try to manipulate and coerce the individual to do what they said. Are you with me? There are some as an individual, they think they have a word from the Lord. And so they will share that word. But if the person doesn't immediately respond to it, they will try to make the person do it. They'll begin to pressure the person into responding to that word from God. That's manipulation. It's not what God does. That's not being accountable. If God's given you a word for somebody, it's not your job to worry about whether or not they obey it. Your responsibility is just to be obedient to God yourself. It's not your responsibility whether the pastor does what you feel like he, God told you he should do. It's your responsibility to do what God has told you to do. And so if God's given you a word for somebody and you shared that word, you're done. You have no further responsibility other than to pray for them, but you have no further responsibility concerning what they do with what you have given to them. Now, I'm always concerned in terms of, of I want to be accountable to individuals. And, and I will say to people on a frequent basis, I want to be accountable to you. If, does this make sense? Does this word that I'm giving make sense to you? So I want to be accountable to individuals. But I also understand I am not responsible for what they do with the word of the Lord. If I try to force them to be obedient to it, I have now stepped beyond the sphere of responsibility that I have, and I'm taking God's part. I can't do that. Neither should you. I've watched, especially prophetic intercessors, do that. They have a word from God. It's probably a genuine word. And they've shared that, but the response has not been what they think it should be, and so sometimes they come along and try to make the person do it. You can't make them do it. Share it, let go of it. Third and last area of accountability is walk humbly because you can be wrong. You can be wrong. My goal is 100% accuracy. Now, I do understand in the Old Testament, the prophet, the one who claimed to be a prophet, you know, they were measured by that. If they weren't accurate, God said, don't listen to them. If I'm sharing with somebody 
something that I think may be from God. I try to be honest and say, I think this is a word from the Lord, but you're free to judge it. Is this something that makes sense to you? Is, if it's a word of knowledge, is this accurate? I was praying with a lady one night who, who was who living with, with intense pain in her hand, I think it was. And I went to anoint her hand to pray for her hand. And what I did, suddenly this, this really way out there thought came into my mind. So I just said to her, can I ask you a question? She said, yeah. I said, when you were little, was your mother sick a lot? She just looked at me. She said, yeah, she was. I said, when you were little and your mother was sick a lot, did your father holler at you a lot for making noise and disturbing your mother? And she began to weep. And I said, sis, I think what's happening is this. You are punishing yourself for the affliction you thought you put on your mother. And you are carrying pain needlessly. God wants to heal you of that. And he did on that. At that moment, as she forgave herself, God healed her of the situation that she was living in. Now, there may be times, though, that you're going to miss it. Walk humbly. There will be a few times that you will be told that you missed it and you didn't. Because sometimes either the person doesn't recognize themselves in it. I've had people say to the Lord, Lord, he missed that one. And God say, no, he didn't. Here's the situation that I meant by that. I've had situations, and I, I, you tell this story, and Linda, if you'll get ready to go to the keyboard. I should tell this story. And this happened when I was pastoring. That one Sunday evening, I had this very strong sense before the meeting that there would be an individual who would sit on the third row, organ side of the building, outside aisle, and that the color of the outfit that they would wear. It was kind of a brownish tone. And I had an, a sense of a type of need that they would have. Now listen, if you're a pastor of a church, you know where your people sit. Most of us pretty much sit in the same seat every service as somebody gets there first and steals our seat. You know, most of us have a certain seat. We've already got it marked out. That's my chair. Stay away from it. I nobody sat in that seat. But that evening, the organist playing the organ was wearing the right outfit. But I knew the organist said the organist always sat inside aisle about 10th, 11th seat back. But this night, she gets up from the organ, goes to the third row outside aisle, sits down. Now, at that moment, faith's, you know, glowing pretty good on the inside. We get to the altar. She comes forward, and I walk up to her, and full of faith. You know, her pastor, I have a word from the Lord. And I, I said, you know, and I just began to ask her, sis, you know, I begin to share what I was sensing. And I said, does that make sense? And she says, nope. <laughs> the next sound you heard was a pastor sinking. Shh. You know, all the air coming out of the balloon just, you know, I said, and I went to the next person you know, and prayed for them. I mean, there's like no recovery. After the meeting, my wife said to me, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. What did you say to so-and-so at the altar? So I shared it with her. And she said, well, what did she say? She said it didn't make any sense to her. And I said, Michael, you need to know that this morning I sat in Sunday school class with that lady. And for one hour, she talked about what the Lord gave you to say to her. Now, I don't know whether she failed to recognize or whether her pride was not going to let her admit to it. I don't know. I do know that I had to walk humbly regardless, but at that moment when I thought I had missed it, I had not. There will be some times that you will miss it. Confess it. Ask God to help you with it, to be more perceptive and to grow in that. In the last days, he said, I'm going to pour out my spirit. Sons and your daughters. Let me tell you what God's doing now. It's not just for gatherings like this. And I am, I'm winding this down. It's not just for gatherings like this. You know how many people there are in the world that do not know Jesus? In fact, if we were, if we were to take 
the part of the world that's never received an adequate witness of Jesus Christ. And we're to parade them through the front of this building. In fact, bro, come help me a minute. Yeah. What's your name? Dustin? Dustin, if we were to take them, and I just stand, you're right here in the front of the building, and, and Dustin, I were going to watch this face, and I were going to walk every single unsaved person who's not received an adequate witness of Jesus Christ by you. And, and, and just one every second, every second, thousand one, thousand two, thousand three. One person just walking by you every second. How old are you, Dustin? Nineteen. Do you know how old you would be when the last person walked <laughs> by you at zero population growth? Got a cane? <laughs> You'd be at least 79 years of age. 60 years. 24 hours a day. Seven days a week, 365 days a year, 366 on leap year. Of those who don't know him, one a second. Is that pretty incredible or what? Thanks, Dustin. Glad to see you. Now, why did I give you such a discouraging bit of information? Because it's not going to happen just inside the four walls of a church building. It's going to happen outside. And one of the ways God wants that to happen is he wants you to be full of his Holy Spirit so that his spirit can come on sons, and daughters, and handmaidens, servants. His spirit can reveal to them at work a need in the life of somebody they're working with. Standing in the grocery store checkout and the spirit can tell you something either for you to pray or maybe for you to share is that being sensitive to the Holy Spirit to walk back from restroom, ladies room in a, in a restaurant and she's walking by a, a table and a lady's sitting there and the spirit spoke to my wife just being sensitive to the Holy Spirit and before the morning was over the lady's giving her life to Jesus Christ he wants you to become so full so that just in your normal life, man, you're just, you're just at work. Maybe you're on a job assignment. And suddenly, you know something that you could not know. And you don't come on like gangbusters, but just in the middle of while you're there working, you casually say to somebody, can I ask you a question? And you ask them a question that leads directly to remember uh, when Jesus was at the woman with the woman at the well John 4 and she comes out to the well and he's there and he asks woman would you get me a drink and she goes get him a drink and, and then he says to her you see this is the work of the Holy Spirit he already knew this Spirit of God had revealed it to him he said oh uh, go get your husband that's innocent enough but to see that very question the very statement was going to open the door where she was at. Go get your husband. She says, uh, I don't have a husband. And he says, I know. You've been married this many times. And the man you're living with now is not your husband. Next scene. She has forgotten about the drink of water. The water pot is still sitting at the well and she's running in town where every man in town knows her. And she is saying, you got to meet this guy, man. You will not believe what just happened to me out here. And the next thing you know, there's a whole group of people coming out to Jesus and his disciples. And the disciples who had already gone into town to get something to eat, probably Jesus also said, go check out the possibilities of a crusade. And they came back and said, not in this town. Nobody's interested. It's Samaria. They're not interested. And Jesus said, oh, by the way, look, up the fields are white to harvest. There's all these white-robed individuals coming out of the city. Why? Because God, by the Spirit, said, woman, not living with a husband. It may well be that God wants that flow of the Spirit in your life. 
But when we can reach the point of maturity to where we don't have to impress anybody and we're not impressed ourselves with what God does through us, we're just grateful. He can begin to increase that operation. You see, He wants that to become a part of your life. Not just in here. But one of the reasons He wants it in here, not just so that we'll be ministered to, but so that we will learn how to flow in the Spirit. So the same Holy Spirit talks to us out there. Stand with me, please. You have been...